My guest today is Meta Atamel. Meta, how are you? Hey, David. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been a long time. I know. I'm trying to remember when was the last time we met. It uh, must have been. Was it in Romania a couple of years yeah. ago? Yeah, it was definitely IT camp two or three years ago. Something and like that's that. when we used to travel a lot. Yes, back in the days. <laughs> Meta, what do you do for a living? I am a developer advocate at developer relations at Google Cloud. Uh, so my job is basically to go out to conferences and speak about Google technologies and inspire developers and educate developers on different things that we offer. I imagine that job has changed a lot with the current pandemic. Yes, it changed dramatically. Um, so no travel, but now at least we're lucky that we're um, working in a field where we can quickly pivot to online and everything is happening online. Uh, so I'm grateful for that, but yeah. No more travel to cool places. <laughs> Thank, I'm thankful for the cloud. The cloud enables all this stuff. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you and I both work a lot in cloud computing, but I'm, I'm more focused on Azure, um, the Microsoft cloud, and I think I'm going to assume that you're most, more focused on the Google cloud. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned a few um, serverless tools that I wasn't familiar with, maybe because of that uh, uh, difference in the way that we approach things. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, well, let's start off, uh, can you define serverless computing? Well, so that's that's kind of like a million dollar question because when you yeah, say serverless. It's, it's like, a bad name for it, I, I give it that. Yeah, I mean, it's a bad and also overloaded name. So because ah. different people kind of define serverless in a different way. Okay. But I guess in a nutshell, what when we say serverless, what we mean is usually we mean functions that get deployed to a cloud. Um, this can be Azure or AWS or Google Cloud, where you don't really care about the underlying infrastructure. So what you care about is that you know the function responds to an event. Usually this event is an HTTP call or a pop up message or cloud or cloud storage events or whatever the event you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And then you know that's the, that's what we care about. Yeah, your your function basically waits for the events and then. It's deployed somewhere, you don't know where it is. Um, and then one of the key aspects of serverless is that it's automatically scaled. So by default, your function um, will scale down to zero, so it won't be running. But when the event comes in, it will wake up, handle the event in the way that you defined, and then it will go back to sleep again. Um, and the cool thing about serverless is that you know it abstracts away a lot of things for you, so you don't have to worry about it yourself. So all the infrastructure of like, virtual machines or even containers, you don't necessarily need to care about in a serverless world. Um, so that's, I think that's what serverless is in a nutshell um, in terms of like the development model, but also there's the billing model where you you only pay for what you use. Uh, for example, if you are running a piece of software in a virtual machine, you're basically paying for the virtual machine all, all the time. Whereas in the serverless model, you typically just pay for for the request time, so for the time that people are actually calling your function. And that makes a huge difference in terms of what you end up paying in the end, because you don't pay all the time, except you you pay when you actually use the service. Sure, especially if you only have something that's used once a day or once a week or once a month. Yeah, uh, yeah. and that's the reason I say it's a it's a bad name. I, I think I think your definition very much aligns with my definition, but it doesn't. Serverless sounds like there is no server. Of course, there's a server. It's just that the developer doesn't have to think about it. We don't have to okay. hire an infrastructure person to <laughs> maintain that server. Uh, yeah, it's it's not our problem anymore. That's that's yeah. what, I guess the way to define serverless. Tell me about some of these tools that uh, you've used to implement serverless computing. Well, I guess what, what I want to get to is not, not serverless tools per se, but um, serverless container tools. Containers. That, yeah. Well, how do containers relate to serverless computing? Yeah, exactly. So when you say serverless containers, it's kind of like um, it's not common uh, because they're kind of from two different worlds, right? Uh, because as I, we already defined serverless. We just said it's a function that gets automatically scaled and it's abstracted away and all that kind of stuff. But then um, when we think about containers and what containers are, they are basically a way to package your application and your application's dependencies into a context uh, that we call containers. And that context you can replicate in different environments. So whether you're running the context locally on your laptop or whether you're running in Azure Cloud or Google Cloud, 
um, you can rely on the fact that this context is going to be the same. And this helps a lot with um, making sure that you know, the environment that your application needs can be replicated, which is great. So it gives you a lot of flexibility because anything that you can put into a container, um, you, know, you will make sure that the container will run exactly the same way. But then at the same time, it's not serverless because how do you run containers? Um, well, the, I guess the brute force way of running containers is just you know, get a VM, install Docker, and just run it there manually. Uh, that's one way. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> but uh, usually what people typically do is that they run containers using open source technologies like Kubernetes, where you, know, you create what's called Kubernetes pods, and then you define how your container should run and how it's, it's supposed to be scaled and how it's supposed to be served. So Kubernetes helps to run containers, but then again, you need to learn a lot of things about Kubernetes. There's a lot of constructs that you need to be familiar with Kubernetes to make use of it in a, in a good way. Hmm. So, um, so on one hand, you have serverless functions that's very easy to run and it automatically scales and all that kind of stuff. But then, on, but then you're limited with the environment that's given to you. So you can't do everything with serverless functions. Then as soon as you can't do something there, you will go back to containers and say, okay, let me just run this container. But then, then you have to kind of figure out all these details about, okay, how do I construct the container? And then how do I run it? What technology I use? Um, so you, lo you lose all the benefits of this serverless kind of environment. Uh, well, at least I should say you lost, you, you did until recently. Uh, but then there's all these new technologies and open source projects coming up that are trying to bring these two worlds together. So how do you deploy a container in a way that's kind of serverless, Yeah, in a way that you, you get the benefits of the serverless? And one of these projects that I want to talk about is Knative. Um, Knative, it's an open source project. Um, it was started by Google, but now it's totally open source and a bunch of our companies like VMware, Red Hat, and others are contributing to it. And the whole premise of Knative is to turn Kubernetes into a serverless platform, right? Hmm. So Kubernetes by default, yeah, it runs your containers, but there's a lot of things you need to know to get it up and running. And on top of that, it doesn't really give you any kind of serverless kind of environment. Whereas what you can do is you can take your Kubernetes cluster and you can install this Knative components on top. And with that, you get serverless-like functionality out of your containers. So for example, hmm. Um, you can say, you know, in, you can create a Knative service, and then in this Knative service, you can say, okay, this is my container, just deploy it, you know, and then Knative figures out how to, you know, deploy the container, how to route traffic to the container so people can get to it, and then how to auto scale the container. By default, the container starts at one, but it scales up to n that you define, and then it scales down to zero if no one uses it. Hmm. Uh, it gives you like nice little features like you know, revisions, for example, every time you deploy a new version of the container, you get a new revision. And then once you have multiple revisions, you can do traffic splitting with those revisions. Um, so, it, it, so in a nutshell, it basically gives you a way to run containers as if you're running on a serverless platform. So this way you can have the flexibility of the containers. Uh, so whatever you can run in container, you can run on Knative. But it, it also gives you the, the velocity that you get from an, a serverless-like environment. So yeah, so that's one. Um, and Knative, I mean, it's, it's a big project, so there's different bits and pieces to it. Uh, the first part is Knative Serving. Um, Knative Serving is what I just described. Uh, it basically figures out how to route traffic to your container, how to auto-scale it, and how to configure revisions and traffic. Um, the other part of Knative is called Knative Eventing. And Knative eventing, it's all about how to get different kinds of events to your containers. Because as, you, as I mentioned, like in this serverless cloud world, you're usually responding to some kind of event. So it's, in, it's quite important to be able to read events and then respond to those events. And Knative eventing um, gives you the primitives to do, to do that from a container. Um, for example, it, it has different event sources that, that that different vendors wrote, so you can read different, say, Google Cloud event sources, uh, sorry, Google, Google Cloud events, 
or you can, I think there's also some Azure event sources, so you can re read Azure events or AWS events. So events and, are things like uh, dropping a message on a queue or an HTTP request or a database change? Is that what an event is? Yeah, I mean, events can be pretty much anything here. Yeah. Anything that can be emitted from a source in the cloud or outside the cloud can be an event. So just to give you a concrete example, uh, one of the event sources is uh, cloud storage events. And this event source, what it does is that, you know, when someone saves any, a file to a storage bucket on Google Cloud, that will emit an event, and this event will be read by the source into your Knative cluster, and then it will be passed to your Knative service um, afterwards. Hmm. Um, so this whole pipeline, basically, that you have to set up yourself normally, Knative eventing does that for you. So all you need to worry about is, okay, you, I, I'm just going to configure my service, and this is the event um, type I'm interested in, and this is the this is the this is where this event type should end up, and then that's all you configure, and then all the pipeline is done for you, which makes it much easier to respond to events. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's Knative uh, in a nutshell. Um, on top of that, um, there's other things that you can use. Uh, for example, there used to be a third part of Knative called Knative Build, and that was all about how do you go from your source code to a container image? Because hmm. at the end of the day, Knative deploys containers. But going from source code to, to a, a Docker image is not that easy. I mean, yeah, you can write a Docker file, and that Docker file will, will work. But making sure that the Docker file is um, secure and, and it's also as lean as possible is not that easy. Hmm. Um, and also, how do you also kind of build that pipeline? How do you look at your source code? How do you, how do you build it? And how do you store that Docker file somewhere, right? Uh, so there's a couple of projects that help for this. Uh, one is called, that used to be called Knative Build, but then it turned into a separate project called Tecton Pipelines. Um, and Tecton Pipelines, it's basically um, a pipelining tool on top of Kubernetes. Um, it lets you build basically a number of steps pipeline together, uh, any kind of process that you want, you know, any kind of process that you want to run on Kubernetes, you can define in this what's called tasks, and then you can chain these tasks into what's, what's called pipelines. And what Tekton also enables you to do is uh, to build CI/CD pipelines. Uh, so you can say, for example, you know, in this task, I'm going to look at my source code on GitHub, and I'm going to, you know, build a Docker image. And then in this task, I'm going to save that image to Google Container Registry or Docker Hub or somewhere else. Um, so it's useful um, for Kubernetes clusters to be able to kind of build these pipelines and then, you know, go from source code to container images and then deploy those images to, to Knative services, basically. Okay, but, so, yeah. so it's, a, it's a deployment pipeline building tool. Yeah, basically uh, geared for Kubernetes. So you can run it like everywhere there's Kubernetes. And then the okay. other tool that's kind of useful is, I, I would say, is called Build Packs. Um, build Packs... It came from uh, Heroku. Um, Heroku, I don't know if you used it before, but it's basically, it, it's an easy way to deploy web-based applications. So I, I never used it myself, but from what I understand, basically you would just, let's say you create a Ruby application, you would just say Heroku deploy, and then Heroku would just figure out what your application is. It's a Ruby application, um, and then what its dependencies are, and it will just kind of deploy whatever that app needs and make it run. It was almost like a magic thing that worked. Uh, this was the time before containers. Um, then we got containers, which is good because you can define your app and its dependencies, but then you have to worry about how do I write this Docker file? It's not that easy, right? So we went from Heroku-like experience to almost like backwards because now we are dealing with like infrastructure and we are dealing with low level dependencies that normally, you know, application developers shouldn't have to deal with. Um, but thankfully there's this new project. Uh, I think it came from Heroku and also Pivotal, if I'm not mistaken, and it's called Cloud Native Build Packs. And the idea is the same. Basically the experience that you, own, you have on Heroku going from source code to a running service, why don't we try to replicate that for the open source? And they created this project, and this project tries to do the same thing. Um, uh, they created this build, what's called build packs, and these build packs 
they look at your source code and they kind of try to guess what this app is about. Um, if it's a Java app, you usually have Java classes and pom.xml files, or if it's a C sharp app, uh, it's a DLL and CS proj files or something like that. So it has that intelligence to kind of figure out like this is a C sharp app or Java app or Ruby app or whatever. And then it also kind of figures out the dependencies. And then in the end, it creates a Docker um, container, but without you having to write the Docker file yourself. Uh, which is very helpful if you don't yeah. want to get get involved with the the low level details. So yeah, this also is quite useful if you don't want to deal with low level Docker details. <laughs> are, are these uh, UI based tools when I when I have to configure these things, or are they scripting based, or what's the typical way that a developer interacts with them? So all of these tools that I mentioned, like Knative um, and Build Packs and um, Tecton, they're all things that get installed, I guess. Well, not the build packs, but at least Tecton and, and Kinetic, they're all things that get installed on top of Kubernetes. And then the way you install things on Kubernetes is basically you apply a YAML file. So you configure yeah. it through YAML and then just apply that. Uh, and build, build pack is, is um, it's a command line thing. Uh, and there's some configuration with it, but it's this main command line based tool. Um, I'm sure there's some UI out there that you can probably use okay. with it, but I haven't. There's no it. getting away from the YAML and the command line. Yeah, I mean, you know, like with with the Linux world, <laughs> everything by default is like yep. command line, uh, and then maybe there will be some UI built on top of it, but it's yep. um, it's an add-on. <laughs> yeah. Which one do you use? Which of these tools? Um, yeah. I use Knato a lot um, because I like Kubernetes and open source, and on top of that, like Knato makes sense. Um, but then I guess this is a good uh, point to mention also Cloud Run. Um, so Google also has an implementation of Knative for Google Cloud projects, and it's called Cloud Run. And the whole idea of Cloud Run is basically same as Knative, you know, bring serverless to containers, but do it in an, in an even easier way. Because uh, with Knative, you still need to worry about creating a Kubernetes cluster and making sure that the cluster is the right size, with the right, you know, auto scaling on, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and on top of that, you need to also install a gateway um, for the traffic. And that gateway is usually Istio, but it can be other gateways. And then on top of that, you need to install Knative um, again yourself. Uh, it's not it's not too difficult, uh, but there's a lot of things that you need to set in place before you can be productive with it. And then with Cloud Run, uh, basically it's, it's a service. So what you just say is that, you know, here's my container, just deploy, and then all that work is done for you automatically and it runs on Google's infrastructure. So that's my default um, tool nowadays. When I do a service, I just could create a Docker file and just say deploy to Cloud Run and just the easiest way to get up and running. But if I'm running on a local cluster uh, with Kubernetes or if, or if it's not a Google Cloud kind of environment, then I would rely on pure Knative on, on, Knative, uh, on Kubernetes. Uh, that's a lot of options we have. I, I yeah. see, I've written them down here. Knative and then Cloud Run, which is built on top of Knative. Yeah. Tecton pipelines, build packs, all are, are different options you can choose. Um, it, what do you, um, uh, uh, what, is there a criteria for when somebody wants to select one of these? Because I, I'm, I'm thinking you wouldn't use more than one unless you were building like Cloud Run on top of Knative. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on your goal. So if you want to yeah. just, um, if you want to have the capabilities of serverless with containers, then, you know, it's basically Kubernetes and Knative um, or Cloud Run, depending on where you want to run. Mm -hmm. um, for CICD, Tecton, it's a nice way of doing CICD because it's open source and it mm -hmm. works on Kubernetes. But if you already have some CICD solution that works for you, um, then Tecton at that point, it, maybe it's not needed. Um, build packs, it's more recent, I would say, and it, it's more experimental. Um, because like, I mean, it, it, I tried it and it works for simple kind of applications. If it's just a simple, let's say HTTP server, then, you know, getting that recognized by build packs and deploying um, using build packs is gonna work. But then if you have this, um, I don't know, more complicated applications with multiple services and all these dependencies, then build packages will definitely not work for you. Um, so I would use it as more like a, you know, try it out, see if it works for your app. But if not, 
you probably will stay away from it until it matures more and then supports the type of apps that you're writing. I see. Is there any cost to any of these tools? Um, except Cloud Run, they are all open source. So the cost is, I guess, you, you need to run them somewhere. So you need to pay for the, wherever you're running. But other okay. than that, the tools themselves are free. Um, Cloud Run, you only pay for the requests uh, in 100 millisecond increments. So if someone doesn't use your service, you don't pay anything. But then you, other than that, you, 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 you would pay um, every 100 millisecond request chunks. But it ends up being really cheap. Um, if your application is occasionally connected, Cloud Run ends up basically being free because there's a very, very generous free tier. So you can just use that for your hobby applications like I do. Okay. <laughs> so what well, does Cloud Run only run on the Google Cloud? Um, yes and no, uh, <laughs> because Cloud Run has two versions. One is called Cloud Run Fully Managed, and that's the version that runs in Google Cloud only, uh, because it runs on Google, Google Cloud's infrastructure. Uh, but then there's another version called Cloud Run Anthos, and that's basically Cloud Run running on Kubernetes. And that Kubernetes can be anywhere. It can be on-prem, it can be Azure or AWS or Google Cloud. So if you want to use that version, that will run basically wherever your Kubernetes uh, cluster is running. I see. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you think we should? Yeah, uh, let's think. Yeah, I think, I mean, these are the main tools that comes to mind with serverless containers. Um, yeah, I think I think we covered all of them. Where, where would somebody go to get uh, up to speed? if they're, let's say, didn't have much exposure to this? Um, I mean, I guess information is all over the place. So Knative has a site, knative.dev. So I would definitely start from there. Um, I, I blog and write about Knative. Oh, like where's your blog? Um, I actually just, during pandemic, I had the time <laughs> to move it to easy URL. So it's my last name, atamel, A-T-A-M-E-L, dot dev. So at ML .dev, if you go there, um, I talk there about, right now. Yeah, cool. Um, and then I talk about .NET stuff usually, and then also cloud native stuff like with Knative and Istio and Kubernetes and stuff like that. Excellent. I didn't realize you were a .NET guy. I am actually, yeah. Um, and especially with .NET Core, now that it's free or Windows, I can run it anywhere I want. So I'm still using C Sharp and .NET because I, I really like it. I mean. C Sharp has everything you want from a strongly typed language. Uh, so I don't see a reason why I should move from it. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I'm actually uh, working in Java right now for the first time in my life. And there's a lot of things that I, I just miss. I'm like, why can't I do passing parameters by reference? Why, why is that not a thing? <laughs> yeah. just, or the, the things uh, that we had for a long time in C Sharp, now they have it in Java world. And it, I'm like, okay, like we had link, like, years ago and now there's something like that in java or you know stuff like that where i feel like c sharp evolved much faster uh, and has also like a good good like syntax that i that i really appreciate interesting well meta thank you so much for your time and you stay safe yeah you too it was nice talking to you and stay safe in chicago yes <laughs>